Good morning. It's Jeff Christian, CPM Group. It's about 1045 on Friday morning, August 12th in New York. Um, I have a lot of ground to cover today. Uh, there's several things that have been in the market or at least, you know, being discussed about the market. Uh, and I think that we need to pay attention to them. To some extent, they are distractions from what's really going on. But I think given their prominence, uh, they need to be addressed. And I apologize for that. I also apologize for those people who like short videos. Um, the world's complex. The markets are complex. Uh, things are difficult to explain. This will be a longer video because there's a lot of ground to cover. So let's just jump into it. First thing, market update. Ugh. Let's be honest. Gold and silver have been doing what we expected them to do. Uh, they're in the summer doldrums. The prices have come off. Silver's come off more than we thought. It's come back up. It's trading around 20, 2050. Uh, we do think that gold and silver remain vulnerable in August uh, for a variety of reasons. You are seeing reduced investment demand for both metals. Uh, part of that seasonal, part of that is people sort of reevaluating the state of the world and saying maybe things aren't falling apart quite as rapidly as I thought they would. Um, uh, so um, maybe I need less precious metals. Um, and there continues to be some of that dissatisfaction. Our expectation is that, yes, the markets are vulnerable. We've seen the decline. We could see another wave of lower prices over the next uh, several weeks during August, maybe into September. Uh, beyond August into September, October, we think the prices will strengthen. We don't see them running away to the upside unless something critical happens in the economic or political environment. Uh, we will be having the U.S. elections coming up, and that's going to be interesting to watch. Uh, but we're pretty much steady as she goes. Looking at inflation, we've had both the U.S. CPI, Consumer Price Index, and Producer Price Index for July come out this this month of uh, this week. And what we're seeing is, again, you know, what we've been saying. There are transitory inflationary pressures and there are secular inflationary pressures. And some of those secular uh, transitory uh, pressures are, in fact, transiting. Uh, we're seeing lower energy prices. These are consumer prices. I apologize for the quality of the uh, charts, but these are directly from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And maybe if the government were better funded, uh, it could have better graphics. But, you know, uh, the top chart here is the month to month change. And we saw headline inflation up about uh, actually zero in July. It had gotten very strong in July, 1.3 percent, which was the highest period of highest month to month inflation um, in this round of inflation that started last March, April of 2021. Uh, and we saw it spike up. And if you remember from our video, when that came out in the middle of July, we were saying it was very worrisome because the inflationary pressures were across the board. There were higher food prices. Uh, energy prices were mixed with oil prices actually starting to decline, but other energy prices were up. But you had seen big increases in everything in the core inflation, X food and energy, if you start looking at goods and services uh, across the board, you saw stronger increases. The broader economic economy was catching up with the food uh, and energy prices that had risen sharply. The bottom chart is the year over year data. And you can see, yes, it looked like it was peaking in June, and, and the headline inflation, which includes a hefty decline in uh, petroleum prices, gasoline prices, fuel oil prices, uh, the, uh, the headline inflation was coming down in July, the rate of increase was coming down. And one of the points that we always have to make is, gotta talk about price levels and changes in price levels. Inflation is a combination of both. We're seeing prices stay high, but the rate of increases in prices is slowing and it's much more different. Uh, and then you can see core inflation, X food and energy was basically, it was up 0.1% higher 
uh, the rate of increase last month. But if you looked at the components, and I won't bore you with them, uh, what you see was about half of the non-food and energy components, both on services and on goods in the consumer price index, were declining 0.1 to 0.5%, or rising 0.1 to 0.6%. So you're seeing a mix there. You're starting to see some of those transitory inflationary pressures dissipate. There are some other secular uh, inflationary pressures that remain, uh, and you're starting to see that. And it's sort of what CPM Group, the Fed, and other mainstream economists have been saying for a year plus, about 15 months. Um, and um, sorry for all of those arm-waving, crazy people saying, talking about hyperinflation. Producer prices were even more dramatic. Now here you have to look that that blue line is uh, demand for goods, and it came down sharply uh, in July because of lower en energy prices. If you looked at it in terms of uh, demand, final demand for um, other products, you saw weaknesses, you saw smaller declines in overall, and you saw a movement toward no, decline, uh, no increases in other uh, factors. And then the bottom, again, is year over year, you're seeing a similar pattern. So what we're looking at inflation is that, yeah, prices are high, they're gonna stay high, but the rate of increases is slowing, the Fed's actions to quell inflation by raising interest rates and sucking excess liquidity out of the economy, i.e. Not, not buying bonds and pumping more dollars in the way they have been, is having some effect. You're also seeing, a, I think it's a $1 trillion reduction in the fiscal stimuli year over year uh, coming from the federal government. So that is having the effect of quelling some of the inflation. And you've had an overall slowing in the economy, which also reduces inflationary pressures. Those trends that we're starting to see over the last three, four months probably should be expected to continue unless something changes, right? Um, now, the next things I want to talk about really are distractions to what's really important in the market, but I think they need to be talking. We had a trial of three JP Morgan precious metals traders uh, in Chicago. Uh, last, the trial lasted three weeks. The jury deliberated for several days, I think maybe eight days, uh, and the verdict came down uh, this week, I believe Wednesday. And it was all about spoofing. It's very important. And it's very important to understand what spoofing is, so I think it's important. So let's talk about what the jury said. It found Mike Novak guilty of 13 instances of spoofing. It had charged him with many more, and those charges were he was acquitted on. I'm sorry, it doesn't. It says here that they were dropped. They weren't dropped. He was acquitted on them. Trader Greg Smith was convicted of 11 charges of spoofing, and the other ones he was all acquitted on. He was convicted on 11. Jeffrey Rufo was acquitted. There was no guilty verdict on any of the racketeering charges or conspiracy charges. The pre prosecution presented no evidence in the trial, no testimony in the trial that any of the defendants ever talked among themselves about, hey, let's spoof the market. The jury stated that JP Morgan's trading operation was not run like a cr criminal enterprise. So that's the verdict for JP Morgan. These two guys were found guilty of spoofing a dozen times on average. Most of the charges they were acquitted on. JP Morgan was not seen as something. Now, let's talk about the other part, aspect of this verdict. All of the RICO charges, the racketeering charges, were dismissed or acquitted. The jury and the court said, there's no racketeering here. That has big problems for the prosecutors because they have been using RICO 
in other pending cases against other financial institutions. And you see from the verdicts here that the prosecutors, the Department of Justice, the uh, Federal Department of Justice, is running risks of countersuits and just and accusations of prosecutorial overreach. You also have the issue that there were a couple other people who worked at J.P. Morgan who said that these guys had uh, colluded and conspired to spoof, including Jeffrey Rufo. Uh, that's perjury. They didn't testify. Interestingly enough, the prosecutors didn't call them, apparently, to testify. So there was no testimony that these guys had conspired to, to uh, spoof the market. So it's kind of interesting. I wouldn't be surprised if there's some civil slander suits. Now, let's review what spoofing is and does, because it's not well understood, and a lot of strange, terrible people on the internet make more of it than it is. What spoofing is, is when you want to buy or sell a commodity or an equity or anything else, a head of lettuce at a store. Spoofing occurs across all markets and has occurred across all markets since at least biblical times. Um, when you want to buy, you issue some sell orders. That may exert some downward pressure on the price, and then you can buy at a lower price. And you want to sell, you issue some buy orders, and that may elevate the price, and you might get a better price. That's what spoofing is. The effects of spoofing on the prices, if it occurs at all, is in a matter of seconds and minutes. Once you've placed the order you want, you liquidate the orders that you don't want. Spoofing does not affect prices beyond a few minutes. And nothing about spoofing supports any contentions that there's a broader, longer term effort to suppress prices. So anybody who tells you, well, the spoofing trial and the verdict, and they found these guys guilty of a dozen uh, cases each, or 13 and, and 11 to be accurate, uh, because I have to be accurate, because some buffoon's going to say I was inaccurate and wrong uh, if I'm not. Um, anybody who tells you that these spoofing verdicts is evidence of a larger, broader conspiracy to suppress prices is wrong. And as I've said in the past, and as I just explained now, let's say that you want to sell gold. You drive the price up with spoofing. Oops, this isn't a matter of pushing the price down. If you want to buy gold, then you're going to maybe be able to suppress the price and push it down for a matter of seconds or minutes. That's what spoofing is. And it was, I believe, made illegal formally uh, in financial markets in 2010 with Dodd-Franks. So let's be very clear about what spoofing is and then get on with life. Now, other people keep saying, well, this is the prelude, there's gonna be more trials. No, this is the epilogue. Yeah, the Justice Department, the SEC, the CFTC, uh, the controller of the con currencies and the Fed all examined JP Morgan across financial markets in the previous decade and charged JP Morgan with various efforts to manipulate prices on a short term basis through spoofing. And JP Morgan settled 2019, 2020, they went into a long period of supervision by the Fed and the SEC and the CFTC. They have come out of that. They have paid $920 million for creating an environment that allowed spoofing. That's all what happened. This is the epilogue where the Department of Justice has come after three individuals and aggressively said you were part of this JP Morgan. This is not the prelude to something greater or bigger. It's the epilogue. 
So maybe we can start paying attention to things that are important to the market. So let's talk about silver inventories because you're hearing that the world's running dry, you know, COMEX, London, falling silver inventories, the price is going to rise, blah, 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 blah. The current decline in reported market inventories is not unprecedented. I'll show you some data in a second. In fact, in percentage terms, it's very small compared to what happened in the 1990s. The relationship between rising and falling, high and low reported market inventories and prices is not what these promoters have been saying, by the way. In the 1990s, I'll show you in a second, you had a similar decline in reported market inventories, which because the market was much smaller back then and London data was not available, was a much larger decline in reported market inventories. And the silver price did not rise. It was flat for another decade. So lower inventories and a sharp decline in inventories did not push prices higher in the 90s. Uh, didn't push prices higher in 1979, 1980 either for that matter. And in the 20s, in the oddies, you saw a period where reported market inventories and prices were rising sharply together. I'll show you some data. Now, all of this stuff is readily available in the market. CPM Group has been writing about this every year since the 1970s. Right? So somebody who's holding himself or herself out as a silver expert should know this, you know, and it's been well documented in our lowest price product. You know, our yearbooks are $160. Somebody who wants to pretend to be an expert on silver really should buy that. I mean, one of the guys who made a fool of himself last June, actually, when he got into the business around 2005, 2006, got CPM Group's data didn't help him. He's still talking about $1,500 or $1,000, $20,000 silver, uh, but at least he knew that he was full of nonsense. Now, first, understand there's ample silver inventories. Most of them are in unreported inventories. This is from our silver yearbook, 160 bucks, and you could have known it. Um, the gray stuff at the bottom and the brown stuff at the bottom, those are uh, eat, uh, exchange traded products and, and market inventories. And you can see they have been rising since 2005. Price of silver rose from $5 in 2005 to about uh, $30. Well, it got up to $50 briefly in 2011. Uh, and it's been you know well above uh, $15 for most of the period since that time. But let's delve into the reported market inventories. And let's start with this. Here, market inventory declines in perspective. But these are the levels in perspective. And I picked the end of January 2018 because if you go back to that price chart at the very beginning of my presentation, that was a period where the silver price was low, investment demand was low, the silver market was toward the end of a multi-year bear market. And at that time, you had registered inventories on the COMEX of about 45 million ounces. And as of last, uh, Tuesday, August 9th, when I pulled this data together, you are, or actually I did pull it together on August 10th using August 9th data. Again, I have to be accurate because somebody's gonna say, Jeff Christian, you know, he's full of shit, you know, he makes these mistakes. 55 million ounces. In other words, the inventories that were registered with COMEX this past Tuesday were 23% greater than they had been at the end, at the beginning of 2018. Total COMEX silver inventories, which include eligible as well as registered, uh, went from 246 to 334 million ounces over that same period of time, a 35% increase. So yes, inventories are down from where they were a few months ago, the start of the year, but they are still 23, 35, pick your number, percent higher than they were when the silver price was $15 an ounce. London, yes, we've seen a decline, uh, about 10% in reported London inventories since the end of 2018. 
London inventories were only started to be reported in 2016. So I took it back to the beginning of that period, uh, January of 2016, and you can see that inventories are still about 5% higher. And I should say that, you know, you can see here, you've gone from 1.1 million ounces uh, at the beginning of 2018 to 997,000 ounces in London. 91 million ounces of the withdrawals that we've seen this year in London inventories probably are related to investors selling SLV positions. And that silver, which was stored in London for the most part, and uh, has, has been moved out of the, those depositories. Uh, Shanghai, meanwhile, you've seen about a 56% increase, but you'll never hear those bulls talk about Shanghai silver. Different way to look at it, and I'll show you a chart in a second where this highlights. In the 1990s, reported market inventories were 350 million ounces. And they fell 250 million ounces over the course of a couple of years in two big spikes down. I'll show you the data in a sec on the chart. You had a 71% decline in silver inven market inventory, reported market inventory. Remember that when you, I show you the silver price on the next slide. This year, you've seen it go from 1,500 to 1,300. It's about a 13% decline because you're working from a much higher base, but it's 200 million ounces as opposed to 250 million ounces. Here's the good data. Okay, first off, the blue line is the price. You can see how the silver price rose very sharply in 1978-79 into January of 1980. And you can see that from the green line, which is reported market inventories, that they were largely unchanged throughout that period of time. So the price went from $5 to $50, not because we were running out of silver reported market inventory. Fast forward into the 1990s, and you can see that mar reported market inventories now have gone from about less than 200 million ounces to more than 400 million ounces. And they fell sharply in two different periods, first around 1993, 1994, and then around 1996, 1998. The price of silver was flat for the next decade. I should point out here, because I heard this weird thing on some internet thing, where somebody was saying, well, he, he malattributed a, an event on the COMEX around 1994 to Berkshire Hathaway. And he claimed that Berkshire Hathaway had jerked around with COMEX silver options uh, in order to start accumulating metal. That wasn't Berkshire Hathaway doing that. And, you know, the guy ought to be sued for libel. Also, I've heard several people re opine recently that Berkshire Hathaway took its silver out of Comex. Berkshire Hathaway took no silver out of Comex. All of the silver it took, it took out of the London market. So beware of false profits. And again, this stuff's available. 160 bucks and you could actually sound like an expert who knows something instead of acting like an expert who's just like coming up with God knows where you get these things. Now, fast forward to the period 2005, 2011. And you can see that inventories were rising very sharply as the silver price went from $5 to $35 on an annual average basis, $50 on an intraday basis, $49.95. If you look at that and you say, okay, we had a big decline in inventories in the 90s and it did nothing for the price. And we had a big increase in inventories in the Audis, and the price of silver rose sevenfold on an annual average basis. Silver investors, silver bulls, should be hoping to see rising inventories because they seem correlated with rising prices. And they shouldn't necessarily bemoan declining inventories because declining inventories historically have been correlated with flat prices. I'm not saying that that's true. I'm not saying that rising inventories necessarily will reflect rising prices. But what I'm saying is that anybody who sits there and says, well, prices 
are going to skyrocket because inventories are falling don't know no history. There's another way of looking at it. This is also from our silver yearbook. These, the yellow line is the month and inventories. And I use this because you can see much more clearly the big decline in 1994, 1996, which had nothing to do with the options trade that this guy attributed to Berkshire Hathaway inaccurately. It had to do with other things that were going on. And then a big decline in 1970, 1998. Now, that was not Berkshire Hathaway buying that silver but it was some of the people who had sold Berkshire Hathaway silver for forward delivery in 1997 for forward delivery in 1998, sourcing the metal they needed to find in New York and shipping it to London. But you saw these two big declines and this chart shows it much better. And again, you know, 160 bucks, and you can act like an expert who actually knows what you're talking about. And again, well, you know, we use this chart because you can see that compared to deliveries, there's ample inventories. And you can put this decline from 400 million to 330 million into a perspective as to how low COMEX inventories are not. And I mean, there was a third chart in this year's silver yearbook and in past silver yearbooks showing the same decline in the 1990s. So there's no reason there. And then there were tables with the actual data. So you could make your own charts, you could do your own statistical analysis. You could do a R squared of inventory changes and silver prices and then say, yeah, okay, not really a precursor. London inventories are back down almost to where they were when they first started reporting them in uh, 2016. And Shanghai stocks are a multiple of where they were a decade ago. So the world's not running out of silver. A couple other questions and comments. Somebody wrote, why does a group that claims to be an advocate for PM investors have such an added antagonistic attitude toward its consumer demographic group? Well, Brent, we don't. We're not antagonistic toward investors. We work very hard and we have for half a century to serve our clients, most of whom are predominantly investors, but also mining companies, refiners, smelters, industrial users, governments, and investment service providers. I repeatedly pointed out that less than 1% of our revenue comes from bullion banks, historically. Um, we're not antagonistic. We're trying to help you and other investors be profitable in your silver investments. What we are antagonistic about are people who don't know what they're talking about or know what they're talking about and purposefully misrepresent the silver market, lying to investors uh, and misrepresenting the market and causing mainstream investors to say, you know, gold and silver are full of like, it's full of crazy people and uninformed people and really disreputable, clearly dishonest representation by people who are hawking silver and gold, usually at high premiums. That's whom we're antagonistic about. Know who your enemies are, Brett. Now, it's not just me that was astounded by how misguided Brett was. Senor Applegate, hello, Senor, also wrote, you know, PM investors are consistently let down by their perma bowls yet they keep returning to their own vomit, his word, not mine, because of a psychological trick that someone telling you your favorite asset will go up, feels like you are on the right side. Antagonistic about, not Senor Applegate. We like Senor Applegate. You know, I'm Brett, Brett responded. He said, I'm, I'm sorry, that's not my story. Sorry. Well, Brett, if it's not your story, why'd you repeat it? Take responsibility for your actions, Brett, and figure it out. Who's fooling you? Not CPM group. Okay, we're gonna be at the Silver Symposium, 30th, 31st of August, be there. It's going to be great. All of this stuff, if I pissed you off just now, 
you can come and talk to me about it during the open forum or during other uh, breaks in, in the event. Uh, we are going to have an evening presentation on the evidence for and against silver market conspiracies, where we will be further providing evidence about how wrong people can be. You know, and I understand that, you know, first off, the marketeers, this is their job. They're not going to change their tune. They will always be out there saying there's a conspiracy. And the true believers, we're not going to change their view because they don't, you know, to change their views based on evidence or information or something they can actually see, that's heresy for a believer. Belief is defined by not knowing something, but believing it. Yeah, I mean, I was raised Catholic. I know what that's like. What we can do is we can help other investors who look at a world that's pretty crummy with a lot of problems and very dishonest politicians running governments around the world uh, and very self-serving bankers. You know, I have a slide I use sometimes which is a picture of Jesus throwing the money changers out of the temple and a picture of Mr. Potter, the banker from It's a Wonderful Life. And I have the headline, it's like, you're surprised that bankers are self-serving. Like, where did you grow up? Not in the Catholic church. <laughs> yeah. um, but anyway, um, we'll have a very good time and you should be there. It should be a very interesting time. You can buy our yearbooks. And then you can sound much more authoritative. Well, you some of these guys sound really authoritative. They're just not. You know, world's running out of silver. Well, okay, it's not, but it's running out of the energy that's going to be needed to mine the silver. Well, it's not. Um, but you sound really authoritative when you're saying that stuff. And you can go to our website and read all kinds of stuff. Sorry I went on so long, but like I said, it's a complex world and it takes complex explanations to make sense out of it. Take care, have a good weekend. We'll talk to you next week.